Good morning or afternoon. It's the 1st of June, 2022. And I'm here with three participants in the IZA's annual conference on family and gender. This year, focusing on family. And there are a lot of interesting papers being given this afternoon and tomorrow, but I want to focus on three in particular. And I'm very pleased to have with me three of the participants. Matthias Dripke, who's a professor at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, Herda Strangem's daughter, who is, I believe, at the Copenhagen Business School in Copenhagen, Denmark. And Christina Gottman, who has recently, in my view, moved to the Luxembourg Institute for Social and Economic Research in Luxembourg. Anyway, thank you all for being here this morning. What I'd like to do is ask each of you back and forth a couple of questions and then go into some general questions for all of you. So let me start with Matthias. And it's a question based upon the paper he's presenting later today. And the question I have is, why is this recession so different from other recessions in how it's affected male and female workers? That's the first of two questions. Any thoughts on that one? Yes, uh, so thanks for having, uh, having me on this panel. Uh, it's an interesting question because it has been completely different. So, so women's uh, employment has fallen by more than that of men in many countries. And uh, in many recessions, uh, the usual answer has to do with sectors of employment. That's true here too, that uh, in a regular recession, we have sectors like construction going down a lot, which uh, employs many men. Uh, this time, the uh, most affected sector was hospitality. It was restaurants, which shut down completely, and many women work there. So that's kind of a parallel that just the industry structure is different. On top of that, we have the childcare issue. We had uh, school closures often for extended periods. Somebody had to take care of children, and often it was uh, the uh, mothers more so than the fathers who took on this extra work and therefore had less time for uh, 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 less time left to go back to the jobs. So we break down the drop in female compared to male employment in terms of the causes, sectoral versus childcare versus whatever else might be going on. And so we break this down. If, of course, yeah. it varies by countries because we have quite a bit of variation in school closures. So say in, in Sweden, uh, very little happened. In the United States, here in Chicago, schools were closed for more than a year, uh, for example. For the United States, our kind of baseline estimate is that about 50% of the gender gap has to do with uh, sectoral uh, impacts and about 20% uh, comes from childcare. And it seems about, you know, as far as it could go uh, for childcare, just because, uh, you know, many women, of course, don't have little children, uh, you know, currently some are younger, some are older, some don't have children. Uh, so that's as far as you could get. One interesting what's finding the, is, yes. What's the other 30%? Uh, yes, and that's an interesting question because we thought this should be all, and there's in fact more. And so we find that even if you control for industry and occupation and you control for having children, women still lost more employment. So we don't quite know. It could be other care work, for example, you know, sick uh, uh, grandparents that have to be taken care of, but maybe women did that more also. It could also be that just women were more careful. You know, that, that, you know, we were worried, of course, about getting sick in the pandemic. Maybe uh, women were a bit uh, more careful. We know that uh, sometimes men are not really that great at uh, assessing risks and are a bit crazy. And so, so maybe women decided to uh, stay home a bit longer because of the risks you know, of getting infected at work. That's an interesting thing. I wonder, I try doing an informal survey every time I ride the subway in Manhattan, New York, about who's wearing masks. And I've seen no correlation by gender. So I really wonder if the conventional wisdom about women being more worried about infection is really the case. I don't see that here, but New York is obviously atypical of the United States. Right, yeah. So, so, you started to say some other interesting story. Why don't you go into that? So, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. It's, uh, um, I have uh, not really seen research you know, on the kind of mask wearing uh, by gender. We see from a lot of other evidence, you know, that, that, that uh, just uh, men are just more, you know, risk loving uh, in, in general. We know also for healthcare behavior that, that women are kind of better at taking care of themselves, you know, getting checkups, you know, uh, uh, eating right. You know, so there's some indications that, that women might be more, um, more worried. But more generally, this is really not something we have answers on yet. You know, I think the research is focused on gender and, uh, uh, employment industry, uh, there's a lot more going on. And, uh, and I think we just need more empirical research to figure out what's uh, that other 30%. Always a good answer. More research is needed. <laughs> That's right. Somebody has to do the work. That's yes. what we look for. Anyway, let me move on to Herdes. Uh, it's a different topic entirely, but all of these do overarch within couple relationships. So this is a very depressing topic. I mean, what your research is on, because I mean, those of us who've had children who had a serious cancer, uh, 
even if the child is in his 40s, as mine was, he's 45, he's okay now, you go crazy worrying about it. And the question is, who goes crazier? Who is more, whose behavior is more affected by a child's cancer? Uh, I wondered, is there any difference in terms of whether the cancer is eventually cured or whether the child doesn't survive? Does that affect the gender difference? Why don't you go into those and I'll ask a second question after that. Um, yeah, so, so, what we, so we do look at uh, what happens to mothers and fathers in Denmark when their children are diagnosed with, um, with cancer. Um, and first we look at the labor market outcomes and we see um, a huge drop in income and labor market participation for both moms and dads in the mm -hmm. first uh, three to four years after diagnosis. Uh, but the, the drop um, in income is much bigger for the moms. So we see about 25% uh, drop in, in earnings, while it's about 10% for the, for the fathers. And then <clears throat> we see that after the three to four years that the um, labor market outcomes recover. Uh, for the fathers, they fully recover. For the mothers, they stay around 5% uh, lower than the comparison group. And um, as you asked about the difference uh, by, by survival, we see that this long-term impact is mainly explained by, by parents who lose their child. Um, so that is kind of what is explaining the, the long-term um, long impact on the labor market. But even after the child's died, fortunately, after two or three years, is there still an effect? Yeah, so we are able to a time use effect at that point. Right. Be, if the child's passed away after two or three years, mm -hmm. then by four or five years, it can't be any effect in terms of how the parents are using the time anymore. So, what's so, going on in this case? Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I think there are a couple of things. Uh, I mean, we did look at uh, also mental health. Uh, and there we see a big impact on both moms and dads. Um, so I think this is uh, explaining some of the, the long run effects. So we are able to follow the parents for 12 years after the, after the diagnosis. But then we also look at fertility and the parents who lose a child are much more likely to have more children afterwards. So that is also explaining some of the long-term impact um, on the labor market. I just wonder how much of this overall effect is psychological from the loss, how much because as you say, of the replacement, to use a rather unpleasant word, uh, of the lost child and so on. And we really need to parcel those different things out. Essentially, as I asked Matthias to parcel out the uh, effects of the COVID recession on people. Let me ask another question, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, does family income matter? Uh, yes. So we try to separate families by socioeconomic status. And again, the long-term impact seems to be driven by mothers from the lower socioeconomic status uh, groups. Um, so higher income groups seem less effective, uh, affected in the, in the long run. Is this because the mothers at the lower income level lose a higher fraction of their income? or because they're simply so near some subsistence level that it makes life very difficult for them? Um, is it absolute or relative is the question I'm asking, really. Sorry? Is it absolute in terms of the loss of income or is it relative, namely the fact that the woman at the bottom loses a thousand Yeah, euros? so it's it's relative, right? And, and much of it is explained by women moving to part-time part -time jobs. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people advocate creating part-time jobs to help women, and yet this is one which, in fact, if those jobs were there, it's not so clear it'd be a greatest thing at all in these cases. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Do you have information on how serious the cancers are and whether the seriousness of the cancer, if the kid survives, has affected things? Uh, we haven't, uh, we don't have that information yet, uh, so we haven't been able to look at that, but that's definitely something that, that we would um, like to do.
I the only thing we can see is the, the survival, yeah. Okay. I wonder if the cancer diagnosis, would the effects be the same as some other serious illness? So I can't think of what that might be. Mm -hmm. But you know, do you know anything about that or, or, or not? Um, so I, I have a related paper where we look at um, childhood disability, okay. um, which is a bit different because there it's a, it's a permanent shock. So there we see a much bigger long-term effect than by the, by the childhood um, cancer. Okay. That makes sense. That's one old papers like 25 years ago where they had information on time use of mothers with children with uh, Down syndrome mm. uh, for whom the time spent taking care of the kid was just astronomical. It clearly interfered with their labor market activities. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me move on and ask Christina about her work, which is somewhat related to the other two. I mean, it's a little bit different, but uh, a guy loses his job. We know women tend to go work more as a substitute, typically. Question is, how is the wife's health affected? Well, um, as it turns out, if a man loses his job, um, the partner the woman um, actually also has her health negatively affected and has a higher mortality risk. And what's really amazing is that if the woman loses her job, neither the woman nor her partner, um, the man, actually has any negative implications for health. So that's kind of our puzzle where we started the paper. That's a start. Where do you go from there? Well, I mean, of course, first of all, you try to see, you know, what could be going on and is it because women are less likely to work um, and you try to figure out, is it because women maybe are in more secure jobs? Is it because, um, uh, you know, all kinds of other, um, they, they work in different sectors, they have different occupations. So you really try to establish whether this phenomena is, is sort of robust to all kinds of stories you can come up with. And it turns out it is. So this health spillover and gender asymmetry is something we do find um, throughout. Um, and what I find even more stunning is that we find this in Finland, which is a country very high in gender inequality. You know, you have a female prime minister, the cabinet is 50% women, and still we find these stunning um, gender differences. So the question is, I always ask on studies like this, which really demographic studies, why? Why is the women's health bothered and the men's not? In the, in, in the, if, if the partner is suddenly uh, loses his or her or his job, why is the difference? Why does the asymmetry arise? So, I mean, I think as economists, we do have a, a couple of stories that, that we can tell. Um, and it turns out that this story matters. So, um, you know, if you think about um, income losses um, and the pool, pooling of resources, then it's true that in Finland, even though both men and women have almost equal employment rates, men still earn more um, than women. And what we see is that after male job loss, um, the absolute loss in earnings is higher than for women. In relative terms, it's actually quite similar. It's about 30%, but in absolute terms, it's, much, it's a much bigger shock for uh, after male job loss. And so we try to establish um, you know, how important that could be. And that is part of the story that um, the loss in resources seems to affect um, the couple on both sides, both the men and the women. What if you had a case where you had to take all couples whose incomes, whose earnings were equal within 10% of equality and looked only at that group in terms of the effects of job loss of one spouse on the health of the other? Would you still find your effects in that case? So we, we tried a little bit, um, you know, to play around with what if the woman is actually earning more than the man, um, you know, to have a more equal or even dominant, let's say, earner. Um, and it, it turns out um, that alone, so it's not only the resources, it's, it also matters who earns it. Um, so even, even in that sample where the women um, are more um, earning more, we still find an asymmetry. So it's not only the, the dollar bill or the Finnish um, krona in your hand, it's also who earns it. So can we infer from this that it's not just income and also that women worry more about their husband 
and their health gets worse, then the husband worries about the wife when she loses her job. Is that an inference we can draw? So I, well, I mean, that's, that's a tough uh, argument or statement to make. But what is definitely true is that men suffer much more in terms of psychological illnesses after they lose their job. So we, we also look at um, hospitalization for different causes. And what you see is that, you know, they're much more likely to have alcohol issues, drug issues, mental health issues. They're much more likely to die of heart disease, which I think are linked to stress and to despair. Um, and so, you know, I think there is something to it that if sort of the, the man's um, self-understanding, which is apparently very closely linked to the job, sure. um, is scattered, then things go downhill from there. And that has negative implications for the couple. One final question on this, which I know you didn't do work on. What if the marriage is same sex? Do we see this, uh, any kind of asymmetry there? Like does a higher earnings partner's job loss affect the other partner's health and not vice versa? I mean this both for male and female same sex marriage. Any thoughts, any information? So um, I get this question a lot. Um, so the problem is, in principle, the same-sex couples are in our sample because we didn't condition that they have to be different genders. But of course, uh, Finland is a small country, 5 million people. You can imagine a displacement, job displacement, and then you condition on same-sex couples, you're left with 10. Um, so I can't answer this empirically. You would have to do this for a bigger country where we have a bigger um, just a bigger absolute number. But I think in, there are two arguments why I don't think the, the results might um, not be so different. So the first one is that I, of course, think that there is not such an ideal type as men and women. I think the distributions in terms of how women and men um, will react to these negative labor market shocks. And I'm sure there's overlap. So, you know, there's no reason to say they're not couples where um, two men couldn't have a similar situation and, and have different responses. And then I think the other point is that the roles even in a same-sex couple could be very different. One could be the man, male, uh, main earner, one could be more like the, the, the carer. And um, you know, that could in, then, in that sense then play out in a very similar fashion. So I don't expect the principal channels to be so different. Okay, interesting indeed. Let me ask general question to all of you, okay? I mean, the general theme of this, as, as I see it, maybe I'm overgeneralizing, is the idea of asymmetries within couples in a whole variety of areas. And it's the couple that's the crucial thing. The question would be, these are all studies based on data from uh, the teens or the early 20s of this century. What if we go and redo these things in 2052, when I probably won't be around, almost certainly, but most of you will be, do you think you get any different conclusions then? Let me start off with Herodas and then go around to Matthias and Christina. Herodas, you're on. Yeah, um, so I do think, um, I do think that the results in my study um, could be different in that uh, the penalties could be more equally distributed um, between the parents um, but I don't think we will see that gender differences completely disappear. Um, and, and I mean, if we think about the overall child penalty, we see it across time, across countries. It seems to be something that's quite general, but the size of the child penalty is a bit different between the different countries. Um, and I think that kind of gives us some indication of where we are heading. So maybe it will be smaller gender differences, but I think they will still be there. <laughs> Interesting. Christina, any thoughts about your work on this? So I think there, there are two points. Um, so one driver of our results is certainly the differential earnings in the couple. So to the extent that we have um, a more equalization and maybe more 50, 50 share of um, contributions, the effects could weaken. So that's one point. And I guess the other point is um, in our study, we find that men are very much attached to the whatever um, characteristics of their job and if they lose it, it, it really is bad. For the women, it seems to be that the biggest insurance mechanism is having children, interestingly. 
So, um, and I think this also relates to what Matthias mentioned. So I think to the extent that we might have an even more equal share of the caring responsibility and the job becomes more equally important across genders, that could be another equalizing factor. Um, but I have, you know, just like the others, I don't think these differences will disappear even in 30, 40 years, but we might have a convergence. And, and a Is this because difference. of a conversion of income or because of a change in men's attitudes toward the importance of jobs in their lives? So I think, yeah, for women to be less concerned about care and more about jobs. So either, right. either way, I think what uh, would so soften the, the, the asymmetries. Matthias, I realize your topic is a little bit different on this, but we are going to have, my guess is, some more recessions by 2052. Is this baby an outlier, or, 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 or are we going to be having this kind of recession in the future? In you know, I'm sure there will be many different kinds of recessions, and I think uh, all <laughs> of the work we have seen really points out that there's two things. There's the economics, you know, such as relative wages inside couples. There's also other things like social norms and uh, aspirations and uh, you know, expe expectations what the proper role is of uh, women and men uh, that also matters tremendously for the division of labor and for impacts like uh, losing a job. And I think what we see in the data very clearly is that the economics leads the other thing, you know, so, so that, uh, for example, women's participation has gone up very quickly. Uh, social norms are changing with some lag behind that. You know, if you look, for example, at the number of people who think it's just bad for children if moms are not home, you know, this used to be very common to think uh, a few decades ago, these numbers have gone down a lot. Uh, they, could, they could go down a lot more. You know, there's still uh, social norms that uh, emphasize uh, mothers as carers, uh, fathers as providers, even though the economic reality has changed. We also see this across ages, you know, that, that younger people have a lot more equal uh, social norms than older people do. So I think we can be confident that these uh, norms will keep changing. They will keep following the changed economics. Of course, it's hard to tell if they will change you know, all the way to kind of true gender equality. Uh, but I'm very confident that we're going to have a, a lot less inequality by gender in these, uh, you know, all of these events we've been looking at uh, in 30, 40 years from now than we did today. So essentially what you're saying, I hadn't thought of this in these terms, in technical terms, what you're saying is one needs to estimate a VAR model of norms and behavior and test for the relative lags. I've not seen that done, but that's really what you're saying. And I think you see it in the data. You know, I mean, you don't have that much time series, but you see it across the cohorts that uh, older people, you know, kind of grew up in the 40s or 50s. They have very different social norms than uh, the people who are entering the labor market now. And, uh, and on top of that, we also have uh, real changes, you know, such as uh, work flexibility, you know, which comes along uh, a lot more now after the pandemic, which also will make these things easier than before. Right. Let me ask one final question of each of you. Let me start off this one with uh, Christina and then move around to Matthias and Herdes. So you guys all did Finland and the US and other rich Northern countries. And we just heard that social norms matter. What if we did this in Italy or Spain or Portugal? A not poor at all, a totally different kind of culture. How would your answers differ, Christina? So, I mean, I think the, the first order effect, um, you know, talking about um, economic differences and social norms would make me think that these effects should be even stronger in countries that are maybe more traditional, more conservative. I mean, especially if you move to certain developing countries. However, um, you know, I think there is another element that we need to consider that in many, especially in developing countries, the broader family context, the multi-generational insurance mechanisms, the village plays um, also a very big role. So I think um, there you would have to think not about the small family, but you have to think about the extended family. And that could, of course, change a little bit the, the, the picture, um, how insurance works and, and who gets insured. And uh, so, you know, I guess that would be my caveat on the, the simple story. <laughs> Matthias, let me ask you, I realize you looked at the US and I realize industrial structures and attitudes differ. What do you know about Southern European countries in this regard during this past COVID recession? No, so so uh, we have seen in recent decades that things have really switched. You know, it used to be that, uh, say, Italy and Spain had much higher fertility rates than other countries, you know, maybe have to do with uh, Catholic uh, influence uh, being quite high. 
Uh, and now it's the other way around. They have very low fertility rates. And I, th I think what this means is that uh, in these places, the aspirations, you know, that that uh, that young people have are now very similar to Northern Europe. You know, so everybody wants to have both a family and a career. Uh, it's just because of the history, it is still harder to really accomplish this. You know, and that makes uh, gives you both low participation in the labor market, uh, higher child pe child penalties that we talked about, uh, and also um, uh, fairly low fertility rates. You know, and so uh, so in some sense, it's uh, heading in the same directions, but with the social norms component maybe still having a bit of a larger influence and also social policy being being less supportive. So right now I would think the impacts are larger exactly because these other factors that make it more difficult to achieve equal impacts are still more forceful, even though they're being eroded over time. Interesting. Curtis, what do you think about the cancer business in those countries? Um, so I think um, one important element here is the welfare system, um, which obviously is quite strong here in Denmark and in the, in the Nordic countries. And we are actually able in our study, because there was a um, change in the late 90s, which made the welfare system uh, more generous towards these parents who had sick children. And we see that this actually mitigates the impact on the parents, and in particular, this long-term impact on women's labor market outcomes. Um, so in that sense, I, I would expect to see bigger impact in countries where there is less supportive welfare system, which is not only developing countries or uh, poorer countries. I, I would also imagine that we would see a bigger impact in the, in the US. I was going to say that it's a very mm. depressing conclusion, but I agree with you completely. In this regard, the U.S. is more like a developing country than like Finland or Denmark. Fascinating. I mean, let me thank all of you, uh, Christina, Matthias, Erdis, for being with me this afternoon or morning. And I hope your conference goes as well as I feel this video has gone. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>